presentation of Science Trek on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. The Earth is our home, but it's made up of many complex systems working together to keep us alive. Find out more about the Earth. Stay tuned. Science Trek is next. Hi, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen, and welcome to Science Trek, and welcome to Boise State University's Earth Science Research Lab. We're here to answer your questions about the Earth, but before we do, let's learn a little bit more. Let's see if you can keep it up in the air for the longest. Okay. Did you know the Earth is 93 million miles from the Sun? The Earth is the third planet from the Sun. The Earth's orbit is more like an ellipse rather than a perfect circle. The Earth spins on an axis, an imaginary line that goes from pole to pole. The Earth floats at a tilt, and it's that tilt that gives us our seasons as the Earth travels around the Sun. When the Northern Hemisphere tilts away from the Sun, we have winter. And as the Northern Hemisphere tilts toward the Sun, we get summer. And because the Earth is spinning on its axis, one side of the planet faces the Sun and the other is in shadow. That's what gives us day and night. So did you know that oxygen only makes up about 20% of our air? The Earth is covered by a blanket of gases known as the atmosphere. The troposphere is the lowest level. That's where you'll find the air we breathe. The air is about 20% oxygen and about 70% nitrogen, and the rest is made up of other gases. All of the Earth's weather happens in the troposphere. The next layer is the stratosphere. This layer contains ozone, a gas that protects us from the harmful ultraviolet rays of the sun. After that is the mesosphere. This is the layer where meteoroids from space usually burn up, creating shooting stars. Then there is the thermosphere, and finally the exosphere. This is the outermost layer at the edge of space. Let me play! Let me play! No way. Return. So did you know that the Earth's crust is always moving? The Earth has four main layers. At the center is an extremely hot metal core. The core is made up of two regions. The inner core is made up of solid iron and nickel. Scientists think the outer core is made up of liquid iron. They think that the circulation of that liquid causes the magnetic field around the Earth. The Earth's next layer is the mantle. And then the outer layer, the layer we live on, is known as the crust. The crust is about 4 to 40 miles thick and makes up less than 1% of the Earth's mass. It's broken up into pieces known as tectonic plates. Tectonic plates are pushed and pulled around by the slow and steady movement of the underlying rock. As the plates move, stresses build up. Earthquakes happen when these stresses grow big enough that the plates slide past one another quickly, and we feel that shaking. Most volcanoes also appear along plate boundaries. Lots of things can change the Earth's surface. Some change happens quickly from strong forces like earthquakes and volcanoes. Others happen over great periods of time because of processes like erosion from wind or water. You can see patterns in rock formations and fossils in rock layers that show changes in the Earth's surface over time. Humans change the look of Earth's surface too. Buildings, farms, mines are just a few ways we've changed the look of the Earth. And did you know that most of the Earth's surface is covered with water? 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. Only 0.008% of the Earth's fresh water is found in lakes, rivers, and streams. And that's the water we need to live. So when you think about the Earth, think about the systems that make up the planet. The geosphere, the soil, sediments, and solid and molten rock. The hydrosphere, the water on Earth. The atmosphere, the levels of air and gases around the Earth. And the biosphere, all the ecosystems and living things on Earth. 
That's a lot to think about. Please let me play. Go get your own ball. Okay, if you're going to play with one that looks like the Earth, I'm going to play with one that looks like the Sun. What was that all about? I mean, I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> and joining me now to answer your questions about the Earth are Virginia Gillerman, a geologist with the Idaho Geological Survey, and Jeffrey Johnson, Assistant Research Professor of Geophysics at Boise State University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very Thank much. You. This is going to be fun. Let's go to your questions. Hi, my name is Jeff, and I go to Kamiai Elementary School in Kamiai, Idaho. And my question is, what makes the Earth rotate? Well, the Earth rotates because it's always rotated, and that's uh, really a pretty poor answer. But um, it is interesting to note that the Earth is rotating about the same rate it is now as it did when the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. Fact of the matter, it's spinning like a top, and there is nothing out there, no friction that's slowing it down. And it will continue to spin until the Earth, maybe billions, maybe trillions of years from now, impacts with another body. Hi, my name is Billy and I'm from Answer Charter School. And my question is, what are tectonic plates? Well, Billy, tectonic plates are what geologists call the rigid layers of rock which float on a hotter and more fluid semi-liquid rock underneath that we call the asthenosphere. And so the tectonic plates are constantly in motion. And when one of them dives under the other, like on the eastern or western coast of South America, they can form mountain ranges like the Andes and volcanoes like Cotopaxi in Ecuador or similar things are happening in Japan. So it's, it's the boundaries between these tectonic plates that create some of our most interesting geology. Yeah, and one of the cool things about tectonic plates is just how fast they move, Jenna. Uh, tectonic plates are moving constantly, but you and I, we can't feel them. They move at about the same speed as your fingernails grow. Jameson would like to know, how big is the Earth? The Earth has a radius of 6,371 kilometers on average. This is some 4,000 miles in terms of its radius. How far is that? That's about the distance from Idaho to New York and back. And so it's a considerable size. One thing that you may not be aware of is that the Earth has a radius that is a little bit bigger at the equators than at the poles. So think of the Earth as being a sphere that's slightly squashed. Hi, my name is Addison. I go to Answer Charter School. And my question is, will Earth's continents ever meet again? The edges of the continents meet. They meet the ocean plates, and sometimes they meet other continental plates, like in the Himalayas. But Geologists are finding out that over the last couple of billion years, Earth's continents and their plates have moved together and then been driven apart several times. And so we've formed supercontinents like Rodinia and Pangaea that where the continental masses, which are the land that you see that has rocks that have more silicon and aluminum and sandstone in them, those areas, those continental areas, have all been pushed together into these supercontinents and then over time those will break apart again. It's sort of like um, billiard balls, you know, hitting each other and then bouncing off each other. So they will meet again and they'll break apart again. It may take a few million years. Yeah, in, in India and Asia right now are colliding with one another, but it's a slow motion collision. It's, th those two continents are coming together at a rate of only a few inches per year, and they are causing the continuing uplift and growth of the Himalaya Mountains. Eris would like to know, how was the Earth formed? Eris, the Earth was formed a long, long time ago, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth accumulated from interstellar gases and debris, and it accumulated and grew into the blob that we live on today. Allie would like to know, how did gravity get to Earth, and who or what created it? Gravity is a fundamental force that exists anytime you have mass. 
So we have gravity associated with our own human bodies, but the Earth's mass is so much larger that the gravitational force is very much noticeable. This is why we don't float off into space. So we have gravity because the Earth is very, very big and very, very massive. Other planets also have gravity, and gravity can either be greater or smaller depending upon how big those planets are. So if you live on another planet that's bigger, you will have a greater force of gravity and you will weigh heavier. Hi, I'm Kellen. I go to Answer Charter School, and my question is, what purpose do the layers of the atmosphere serve? Well, Kellen, the atmosphere is really critical for us human beings because it provides the oxygen that we need to breathe and to live from. It also provides carbon dioxide, which plants breathe and use in photosynthesis. And then it has things in it like ozone that help protect us from the sun's harmful radiation. So we wouldn't be here without the atmosphere. Um, well, I'm just going to add that their weather is happening in our atmosphere as well. Weather, of course. That's a really important function. You may feel like you're standing still, but as the Earth spins, you're actually moving pretty fast. Depending on where you are on the globe, you could be spinning at just over 1,000 miles per hour. And we all travel at 67,000 miles per hour as the Earth moves around the sun. Hi, my name is Zoe. I go to Answer Charter School, and my question is, how does Earth's atmosphere compare to other planets? Earth's atmosphere is the best atmosphere that we know of for sustaining life. Now, other planets within our solar system also have atmospheres. Most of them are much, much thinner than Earth's atmosphere, and none of them have oxygen, which is necessary for life. One of the solar system's planets that has a very thick atmosphere is Venus. Now, Venus has lots and lots of carbon dioxide, and as far as we know, this is not a gas that's very good for most types of life forms. Kyle would like to know, is it possible to live on another planet? It's not possible for humans like we are to live on any of the other planets that we know about, certainly not in this solar system. They don't have the right amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. Some of them are way too hot, several hundred degrees every day, or way too cold. And our life, our, our humans, and our animals and our plants have evolved under the special circumstances on Earth. So without extraordinary measures as in a space station or spacesuits, we cannot live on other planets in the solar system. Hi, my name's Indy. I go to Answer Charter School and my question is how does the atmosphere keep in oxygen? Well, Indy, the atmosphere has a very important role in keeping in the oxygen. Uh, some of that is due to carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere. And, and I believe some of it is simply due to gravity because gravity still would exert some pull on even gases. Is mm -hmm. that correct, Jeff? Yeah, so gravity ultimately keeps our atmosphere next to the Earth. But it's important to note that we are losing oxygen to, due to um, um, travel outside of our atmosphere as well as by absorption of oxygen in our rocks. So there's a constant balance between production of oxygen from plants and, and loss of oxygen due to escape from the, uh, from the planet, as well as um, processes which lock up that oxygen in our rocks. Hi, my name is Chloe. I go to Hillcrest Elementary School. How does the volcano shoot out lava? Oh, I get this one, Chloe. I love to study volcanoes, and I study how volcanoes produce lava and how that lava gets ejected from a volcanic vent. And so, really, there's one quick answer, and that is volcanic gases drive explosions. And those volcanic gases can be steam, carbon dioxide, or sulfur dioxide, but pressurized gases blow material out of a volcanic vent with more energy and more power than you can even imagine. My name is Sophie and I'm from Answer Charter School and my question is, how do hot spots move? Sophie, hot spots don't really move. It's actually the tectonic plates that move over the hot spot. So a hot spot looks like a pencil that extends deep in the earth. And as the plate moves over it, 
it creates an apparent hotspot track. And for example, the Yellowstone hotspot is currently under Yellowstone National Park. But about 15 million years ago, the continent was situated such that that hotspot was about where the junction of Oregon, Idaho, and Nevada is, is today. And we can track the movement of the plate over that hotspot by looking at ages of rocks, a particular type of volcanic rock, along that, that hotspot track. Hi, my name is Oscar, and I'm from Anzer Charter School. I was wondering how come Yellowstone is so geologically active and why there is no other place in the world like it. Yellowstone is geologically very active, and we think it's active because we can see it today. But there are other places in the Earth uh, that are similar to Yellowstone that have similar rocks. For example, the Topo Volcanic Zone in New Zealand, New Zealand which is also underlain by what geologists call a rhyolitic caldera, which is a large mass of liquid rock or magma that is high in silicon and aluminum. And in that case also, like Yellowstone, the hot magma chamber has heated groundwater and produced geysers, hot pools, mud pots, and similar features that if you visit New Zealand, you can you can walk through. So Ge Yellowstone just happens to be one of the places that's volcanically and geothermally very active right now and that's why we know about it. There have been other places like it in the past and there's a few other places like it in the world today. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add that Yellowstone is special in that it has the most geysers in the entire world. In fact, 50% of Earth's geysers happen to be in Yellowstone, which is wonderful. It's in our backyard and I'm very proud to be living not so far away from Yellowstone. Geosity is the field of study that deals with the representation and measurement of the Earth. And according to the folks at NASA, it's a science that goes way back. A long time ago, in ancient Egypt, a clever human named Eratosthenes figured out that when the sun was directly above a deep well in one city, you could stand in a nearby city to the north, measure the angle of the shadows there, and multiply that by the distance between the two cities to get the distance around the entire Earth. With that, the science of geodesy was born. Geodesy deals with the measurement and representation of the Earth, or to put it more simply, it's the science of where things are, and just as importantly, where they have been and where they are going. Through geodesy, we learn the rough size and shape of the Earth, the direction of its rotation, its distance from the Sun, and more. Through triangulation, we could create detailed maps of entire countries. We even figured out that the Earth isn't quite a perfect sphere. And after some arguments and expeditions to Lapland and Peru, we measured that it's just a bit thicker in the middle. Building on this information, we found tons of practical uses for geodesy. Using stars as reference points and accurate watches, we could reliably determine latitude and longitude so that ships could cross giant oceans to get where they needed to go. Explorers visited uncharted regions, mapped them, and even found the tallest mountain in the world. Later, engineers built railroads to get us to all of these places. With a little math and the same reference surface, rail tunnels could be started on both sides of a mountain and somehow still meet in the middle. Life was good. And once we invented radio telescopes and satellites, things got even better. When scientists used a bunch of small radio dishes like one big one to look at quasars, somebody got the idea that you could use these measurements to determine very accurately the distance between the telescopes. Now we can look at the movement of the Earth's crust, changes in how long days are, and how the Earth wobbles on its axis. Satellites also became very important. By analyzing their orbits, we can learn about our planet's changing size and shape and gravity. And by making laser measurements, we can look at everything from changes in the height and shape of the oceans and ice sheets to how the tides work. So, from ancient Egypt to the hundreds of satellites in orbit today, geodesy continues to have a huge impact on our lives. And all because somebody, a long time ago, decided to look down a well. Hi, my name is Fina. I'm from Answer Charter School. And my question is, why was there volcanic activity in Idaho's geologic history, but there aren't any volcanoes in Idaho now? There have been periods in the past, uh, notably about two million years ago, when the volcanoes of the Snake River Plain were popping up all over the place. 
about 15 million years ago when the Columbia River basalts poured out uh, and flowed all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and about 45 million years ago when the Chalice Volcanic uh, episode occurred. So there's been times when it's been much more active than it is right now, but you never know. Maybe we'll get a big volcanic eruption tomorrow. You know, I wouldn't lose sleep over the idea of a big volcanic eruption tomorrow, but it is important to note that Idaho does have recent volcanic activity. As early, as recent as 2,000 years ago, there were lavas erupted from Craters of the Moon National Monument, which you can visit, that have very, very fresh lava flows. Um, and 2,000 years ago is really a blink of the eye in terms of our geologic history. Gabby would like to know, how do we get earthquakes? Earthquakes happen when rocks break very, very quickly. And when that happens, the Earth moves very rapidly and generates seismic waves, which we can record with delicate and high fidelity instrumentation called seismometers. Seismometer is nothing more than an instrument that records the shaking of the ground with much more sensitivity than humans can. Hi, my name is Aaliyah and I'm from Answer Charter School. Why does California have so many earthquakes and Idaho have so few? You are asking, why is it that Idaho doesn't have as many earthquakes as California? Uh, it's for the simple reason that Idaho is located in the interior of a continent. California is all right on the very edge of where North America and Pacific tectonic plates meet. And it just so happens that most of Earth's earthquakes happen along these boundaries. That is not to say that Idaho doesn't have any earthquakes or won't have earthquakes in the future, but the number of earthquakes in Idaho is far less than it is in, say, California, and the size of the earthquakes that occur here are generally much smaller. The most recent largish earthquake to have occurred in Idaho happened in 1983, the Bora Peak earthquake, and it was a magnitude 7.3 earthquake, but they happen very infrequently. Kara asks, why does the Earth move, but we don't feel it move? Kara, the Earth moves, and it moves over all sorts of time scales, and it moves in very interesting fashions. We, ha we do experience Earth movements when earthquakes occur, and that is when sudden breakage of rocks causes seismic waves to propagate outwards and shake the Earth. People feel it, buildings can be knocked over, and those movements can be very, very intense. Now, the Earth also moves very slowly due to plate tectonic movements. Those plate tectonic movements are so very slow that most of us will never sense them. Those plate tectonic movements occur at rates of only a few inches per year. Very, very slow. And, of course, the Earth is moving simply by rotating each day, but it happens on such a large mass and at such a slow rate that we don't feel it. Hi, my name is Jenneth. I'm part of Answer Charter School, and my question is, why is the sky blue? The sky is blue because the sun, which radiates our sunlight in the form of white light, which comprises all colors of the rainbow, interacts with our atmosphere. Our atmosphere has oxygen in it, which scatters the blue portion of our visible light, and that scattered energy comes down, and we can see it with our eyes. If you were to look at the sun outside of the atmosphere, it would look white. Devin asks, how did the Earth get its name? I, I had to look this one up. And from what I could read, the name comes from an old English word uh, close to Earth. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. But the derivation of the term Earth goes back at least over a thousand years, probably at least 1,500 years that we can trace it through the Germanic languages, uh, including Old and then Mid and Middle English uh, from similar sounding words. There was, I believe, a Norse mythological god of the earth uh, with a somewhat similar name, but earlier than that, I, I'm not real sure. It's a good question for a linguistics expert. And the Earth is indeed the only planet in the solar system that's, that has a name that doesn't come from Greek or Roman mythology. I'm Evan. I'm from Minnesota School. 
And my question is, how does the magnetic field change from north to south? Th this question is a fundamentally important question for which there is no consensus answer. What we do know is that the Earth's magnetic field reverses itself, last reversed itself some 700,000 years ago, and when this happens, compass directions will flip from north to south, and the magnetization of the Earth will change such that rocks, molten rocks which freeze, can record the history of the Earth's magnetic field. And this is how we know about the Earth's past plate tectonic movements. We can record the changing Earth's magnetic field. Virginia, before we run out of time, let me ask you, why did you pick a job that deals with geology? I just like rocks. I like being outdoors, and I like using my mind and solving problems. And I found that geology was a place where I could be outdoors, I could observe things, and I was using my mind at the same time that I was enjoying being outdoors. So I just liked it. And I'm lucky that I found a job where I can actually get paid for doing geology. And Jeff, if someone is interested in finding a job in earth science, what should he or she study in school? So science is one of these careers that's just so exciting for a number of reasons. You have entire freedom to explore um, new areas of research that no one else knows about. In order to become a scientist, the best uh, skills to learn in school are all skills, including math, including science, and believe it or not, including writing skills. Because even scientists who are the smartest in terms of math and science need to be able to convey their ideas to other people and tell their story to the world. Thank you, Virginia and Jeff, for answering questions. I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you, Joan, and thanks to all the students who submitted some great questions today. Yeah, great questions. Keep studying science. Yes. And our thanks also to the folks here at Boise State University's Earth Science Research Lab for hosting us. You can learn lots more about the Earth and lots of other science topics on the Science Trek website. And we'll answer more questions about the Earth on Science Trek, the web show. And if you want to submit a question for Science Trek, it's easy, and you and your class can win prizes. You can send it as an email or as a video question, record it on your webcam or cell phone. And if you're an educator, we'll even lend you a camera. Our last prize winner was Dylan in Mrs. Jacobs' class at Kamii Elementary. So to find out all about the Earth, how to send in your questions, and how to win, go to the Science Trek website. And each week, check out my blog for the latest science news for kids. You'll find it all at idahoptv.org slash science trek. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Science Trek. Presentation of Science Trek on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. If you want to learn more about this topic or watch our videos, check out the Science Trek website at idahoptv.org slash science trek.